wild hearting last night or something. Uh, so I'm going to start talking. Um, so I should maybe apologize. This lecture is probably going to be the most technical of the whole week in terms of for maybe those of you who haven't haven't seen these kinds of things before, but I hope you will bear with me and do ask questions um, in case I'm not being clear, but at some points um, I'm just going to have to skip over parts of, of, of the argument just because uh, it would take too long. So I'm going to start talking about the role of the stress tensor. CFTs. So, the best way to to start talking about this is the way that it appears in a classical field theory. So, in a classical field theory, we have a bunch of fields which I'll call phi, which are going to depend upon R, the position, and we're going to have some action, functional, which is going to depend upon these fields, and it's going to be some integral of some Lagrangian density, depending on these fields and their derivatives, d dr. So you can imagine the action for quantum, uh, for not quantum, for ordinary electro, electro dynamics, for example. So remember we were talking earlier about the, um, how we can think of conformal mappings as being a special kind of infinitesimal coordinate transformation where we take our coordinates, which are r mu, we transform them, r mu goes to r mu prime plus some infinitesimal change alpha mu of r. Okay? So you can think of this as some kind of elastic medium where, where we're stretching it, where we're forming it. In that case, if you allow me to pursue that analogy a bit more, we can think of the action as corresponding to the energy of this elastic medium. And we can look at the response of the action to this, to this change here. And so we're going to look at the linear response of the action. And it's going to be local, so I can write it as, some, as, as an integral over something times the local strain tensor. If alpha mu were a constant, that would just be a constant translation, obviously, the energy is not going to, going to change. So the, the, so the change in the energy or the change in the action is going to be proportional to the derivative d nu alpha mu of r. And the response is going to be what we call the stress tensor, so T mu nu of R, DDR. So this is just what you would expect in, in elasticity theory. This is the strain tensor. This is the stress tensor. 
and the energy is proportional to the stress times the strain. Okay. So this, this equation defines what we mean by the stress tensor. And if we have an explicit form for the action or for the Lagrangian here, we can work out T mu nu explicitly as a functional of the local fields. So I told you that we could break the strain tensor into various bits. Okay, so the strain tensor can be can, can be broken into a symmetric part. Uh, excuse me, an anti-symmetric part. One which is anti-symmetric in its indices which is going to correspond to a local rotation. To, uh, to a part which is diagonal, proportional to delta, delta nu nu. This is going to correspond to a local scale transformation. And then the rest is, is the symmetric traceless part. And this corresponds to a, to a local strain. Now, in this composition here, where we take the scalar product of T of the stress with the strain, we can break the strain into these parts and ask, ask ourselves which, which, which combinations of, of the stress tensor do, do these various things couple to. And what you find is that the anti-symmetric part of the strain tensor couples to the anti-symmetric part of the stress tensor that the diagonal part, so this couples to t mu nu minus t mu nu. This couples to the, this couples to the trace, and this couples to, this, this, this couples to the symmetric traceless, traceless part of t. So you can just do that algebra. What we're doing really is just breaking this tensor down into things which correspond to representations of the rotation group. Okay, so if we now have a, an action which is conformally invariant, that means that a conformal transformation corresponds to something which is a local rotation and a local scale transformation, uh, if the action is going to remain unchanged under a conformal transformation, then this thing has to be zero, this thing has to be zero. So the stress tensor has to be, T mu nu has to be symmetric, and it has to be traceless. So the fact that it's symmetric means that it's, the action is invariant under local rotations. The fact that it's traceless is that it's invariant under local scale transformations. So this is going to be a property of the stress tensor for a, 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 a classical conformal Field theory, yeah. Mister, okay, okay. So, so if you look at this, where I've contracted the stress tensor onto the strain tensor, and I break the strain tensor in, in, into these different linear combinations, I find this linear combination couples that the anti-symmetric part couples to the anti-symmetric part of T. 
and so on. Okay? So if the action is, if delta S is, is going to be zero when this corresponds to a local rotation, this thing has to be zero and so on. Okay? Good. That's fine. You, uh, please interrupt me when I'm not being clear. So um, this is going to be true of a classical conformally invariant action, and we're going to, when we go to a quantum theory, this is, this is we, we are going to assume, or this is going to be a definition of a conformal quantum field theory, that this is also going to be true, that the stress tensor, that the field representing the stress tensor is going to be symmetric. And and I should say the other property, which is not obvious from the way that I've defined it, but will, I hope, become obvious, is that it's also conserved. That is, d mu of t mu nu equals zero, or writing, writing, writing it out explicitly, d by the r nu of t mu nu equals zero. So um, this, this corresponds to the fact, for, for those of you who understand it, that this is a symmetry. Whenever you have a symmetry in a field theory, there is something called Noether's theorem, which says that there is a conserved current. This is the conserved current corresponding to these kind of, 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 of symmetries. But I will make an argument later, in any case, that, that this has to be true. Okay, so it turns out that these constraints on the stress tensor, if we're talking now about two dimensions, which I will be for the rest of this lecture, um, are much easier to understand in, in, in what we call the complex coordinates. And I remind you that these were Z and Z bar, where Z was R1 plus I R2, and Z bar was R1 minus I R2. So these are not Cartesian coordinates, so you have to be a little bit careful here about indices and how to contract them. You can understand this if you write the metric. The Cartesian metric is, is dr1 squared plus dr2 squared. Okay, that's just Euclidean flat space in Cartesian coordinates. But if we write this in terms of c, c and c bar, this is dz, dz bar. Okay, because dz is dr1 plus ir dr2, dz bar is dr1 minus ir dr2. You multiply those, the cross term goes out, you get this, okay? So that means if we want to think about this as g mu nu d dz mu d knew where these are these coordinates here, then actually the metric tensor is not diagonal, it's one half, one half, zero, zero. So if you recall anything about, if you've ever taken a course on general relativity, you learn things about covariant tensors and contravariant tensors, indices being upstairs and downstairs, and the G mu nu is the way of lowering the indices. Okay. So, so for example, um, R mu is equal to G mu nu R nu in general. So, in 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 
so, so for example, if, if we take, um, okay, you will, you will see examples of, of this in a moment. So, uh, so what was I going to say? <laughs> Sorry, I've lost track of my argument here. Okay, so so that means that if we take the trace, this is t mu nu mu nu, which is t z z plus t z bar z bar. But if we use this metric tensor to lower one of these indices, this is actually equal to twice t T z bar z plus twice c c bar, and and because uh, t is symmetric, this is equal to four times t t z bar, or it's equal to four times t c bar z. But in a conformal field theory, this is zero, so this is zero, so. So the components T, Z, Z bar, and Z bar Z are both zero. So that, that, that helps. Now, if you look at the conservation equation now, so let's look at the equation um, D, um, D, D mu T mu nu equals zero. Let's look at that equation in complex <laughs> coordinates. I can take nu to be the z component, so this tells me that dz tzz plus dz bar tz bar z equals zero. Okay, that's just writing that equation, writing out this equation when mu equals z, but we said this thing is zero, so this is zero, and now this thing is proportional to, if I lower the index here, this is actually equal to two times d c bar of t c z. So what we see is that the Derivative with respect to z bar of t z z is actually zero. What does that mean? Okay, so it says I've got this 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 particular component which I'm going to define to be just t, which is the z z component of the of the stress tensor in complex coordinates. In principle, it depends upon z and c bar, but what I've said is that d by dc bar of this thing is zero, so therefore it actually only depends upon z and not c bar. Now in analytic function theory, there is a function of a complex variable. Things that depend upon z and not c bar are called analytic, complex analytic. Analytic, can't spell, analytic. So what we see is that in a conformal field theory, this particular component of the stress tensor is analytic. What that really means now in the quantum theory, in the CFT, is that when we consider correlation functions of T of C, with a bunch of other fields like phi one of C one, C one bar, phi two of C two, C two bar. This thing is an analytic function of C with possible singularities where these these things where C hits C one or Z two. So 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 so, so 
So it's what we call a holomorphic function. That is, it's analytic apart from possible singularities where, where these points coincide. So the whole advantage of using complex coordinates is that because of these particular properties of the stress tensor, we can use the whole power of analytic function theory, we can use Cauchy's theorem, we can use the residue theorem, all of that kind of, of thing. In the same way, if we look at the component which we, which we define to be T bar, which is the C, C bar component, then you can check that DZ of T, C, C bar is zero. So therefore T is, T bar is a function only of Z bar. So it's what we call anti-holomorphic. Okay, so, so the only, in a two-dimensional CFT, there are only two independent components of the stress tensor because I told you that the ZZ bar component was zero. Okay, these components are zero because they're proportional to the trace, the trace is zero. There is one component which is T, which is analytic. There's another component which is T bar, which is anti-analytic. Any questions? Why are they holomorphic? Well, okay, I'm not sure of the precise definition of holomorphic, right? But they're analytic functions of Z. We we will actually see that they what they call meromorphic. That is, they have they're an analytic functions of Z, and they have poles. They have simple poles or double poles whenever Z hits one of these points. Okay, so, so, so I, so I told you that. Uh, um, okay, so I made a jump here, right, from talking about the classical theory to correlation functions in the quantum theory. But uh, that's the jump that we actually have to make, yeah, that's analytic, but except at certain points, right? So log z is analytic except at z equals zero and infinity, that's your branch gun as well. Yeah, sure, but the point is that if you consider this correlation function, okay, then it's no reason to be It's going to be a differentiable function of Z and Z bar at every point except the coincident points. There's no reason for it not to be, okay? And it's not just differentiable, but it's analytic because, it's an ana because it only depends on Z and not Z bar. Yeah. Oh, that's just, just a definition. No, no, no. Just notation. Thank you for that, though. It, uh, yes, I agree. Um, I'm not responsible for this notation. Okay, so now we're going to... Um, uh, Make, uh, make us a step back and we, oh no, uh, one more thing therefore to, to say is that this tells us something about the OPE of Z, of Z with, other, with other scaling fields. That is, in this correlation function, I can ask what happens when C approaches C1, okay? So it has to be analytic except at the point C equals C1. Therefore, we can make a Laurent expansion about that point. So let me actually write that, write that down. 
So I take T of Z and I take, for example, phi J of Z1, Z1 bar. And I look at the OPE. That means that I look at all possible correlation functions with all possible other operators here, but I just want to pull out the singularity as Z approaches Z1. So it's going to have the form of the sum of N of 1 over Z minus Zj to the 2 plus N. That's that uh, uh, reason that I put 2 plus N there is just convention. And then there are going to be other operators here, which I'm just going to call ln phi j at point z1, z1 bar. So I know that, that the OPE is going to have this, this, this form. It can't have fractional powers because when I take t around this, I have to get back to the, back to, to the, the same value. So here is phi j, here is t, t, a, t once around here. All these powers have to be integers and not give me some kind of fractional phase. So this is an example of a Laurent expansion. If, 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 if I only had positive powers of Z minus Zj, this would be a Taylor expansion. But in the OPE, I always expect to have singularities. So there are going to be some, th some things here which are poles and so on. For, ex for example, there are terms here which is 1 over Z minus Zj times something which is going to be L minus 1 by J plus dot, 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 dot. There is going to be a term here which is 1 minus c minus cj squared times L0 by j dot, dot, dot. And, and in principle, there's, there's going to be an, the, the next term is going to be c minus cj to the 0 to the 1 power. There's going to be an infinite number of powers here which are going to look like a Taylor series. And in principle, you can have a large number of, 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 of powers going the other way. However, going the other way, it has to stop somewhere. And the reason it has to, the reason it has to stop somewhere is basically dimensional analysis. You can see that if this thing has scaling dimension delta j, you can, then the stress tensor has dimension 2. You can see that from its definition way over here somewhere. Okay, so, so the action is dimensionless. This is dimensionless. So t has dimensions 1 over length to the d, which is 1 over length squared. So so in two dimensions, T has dimension two. This has dimension delta J. So from this, you see that L zero has dimension delta J. This has dimension delta J plus one, delta J plus two. Going the other way, the terms here are gonna have dimension delta J minus one, delta J minus two, and so on. The reason this has to stop is that this can't go negative. Because if something had a negative scaling dimension, it would mean that its two-point function didn't decrease, but actually increased at the power of r. So, so actually, this Laurent expansion has to stop somewhere. So I'll come back to the last part in, in a moment. What we, what we are now going to see is that these two terms that I've written here, this one and this one, are very special in that we can actually determine what we mean by L0 by J and L minus 1 by J. So we know what 
those, those. Okay, so I'm now going to go through the, uh, the argument for how you prove a, a word identity in a quantum field theory. And um, there's a general kind of way of doing it, and I'll show you the general setup, and I won't go through too many of the technical details. So, so here's the plane. Yes, just a minute. Um, they're not, well, you'll, you'll see what this one is in a moment. But just think of this as an operator, as the operators that appear on the right-hand side of when I make the OP with the T. That's the definition of it for the time being. Right? Okay, so I'm going to take some some field here phi at the, at the center of this circle, so it's going to be a little bit. And I'm going to do the following thing. So I'm going to imagine that within this region here, I'm going to make a conformal transformation infinitesimal one, Z goes to Z plus alpha of Z. Okay? So in this region here, it's going to be a conformal mapping. On the other hand, outside this, so I'm going to call this C, and I'm going to call it C, C prime. Okay? So outside C prime, in, in the region here, I'm just going to make C go to C. That is, I'm not going to do anything at all. And then, um, in this annular region here, I'm going to interpolate between this conformal mapping here where alpha is non-zero and the one here where alpha is zero. So here, I'm just going to make a general mapping, R mu goes to R mu plus alpha mu of R. Now, in this region, such that alpha mu is, is, is differentiable and it smoothly interpolates between, between the conformal mapping that I have here and the identity mapping outside. Okay? I can always do that. And in fact, this function here is rather arbitrary, apart from the fact that it has to smoothly go into alpha across here, and it has to smoothly become zero here. Okay? So you can easily see that this cannot correspond in this annular region, cannot correspond to a conformal mapping because if it were, it would just be the analytic continuation of, of alpha z out, outside this, but we can't have an analytic function which suddenly becomes zero in this region outside, okay? So, this, so in this region here, there is going to be a change in the action which is going to be the integral over this annular region here of t mu nu, t mu alpha nu d to r. So the action is going to change here. It's not going to change here because it's conformal. It's not going to change outside because we haven't done anything. So what we're thinking of doing is, is computing a correlation function of of phi of zero with a bunch of other stuff outside here. So, so these, these dots here mean, mean a, bunch of, a bunch of other stuff. So we can think of this within the path integral formulation as being, uh, I'm going to change my notation here. 
I'm going to perform these fields that my action depends upon. I'm going to call them psi. So I don't get confused with my scaling field, which is here. Phi could be equal to psi, but it doesn't have to be. It could be any scaling field. So this is given by some path integral d psi of phi of zero dot 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 e to the minus the action which depends upon psi. That's the path integral definition of a correlation function divided by the partition function. Okay, so, so this is just like the statistical mechanics trace. This is, this is like the expectation value of an observable is the trace of the observable e to the minus beta times h. This is just the per continuum version of the stat mech. Okay. okay, so now I can try to compute the, the change in this correlation function under making this, this conformal this conformal mapping here, and it's due to the fact that I've actually changed my action. Okay, so so phi zero dot 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 plus 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 the the, the change is one over z integral d psi phi of zero dot 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 e to the minus s minus delta s. Okay, so, so I change my action. Uh, my action is small because it's first order in this very small change. So I can expand this, this, this thing, this thing out and write this as one over z T psi of phi of zero dot 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 one minus delta s of e to the minus s. Okay. So that means I can I can I can think of this as the correlation function where I've got an extra delta s in there. So so this term cancels the one here, and I find that the change in my correlation function can be written as the integral over this annular region of where was it? Um, d mu nu, uh, d mu nu, d mu alpha, alpha, alpha mu. So this is at the point R, this is at the point R, and then a correlation function of this with phi and zero dot dot dot. Okay, so. This is what is called a word identity, though I can massage it a little bit more to make it look nicer. But it says that whenever you have a symmetry and you have the current that generates the symmetry, then the change in the correlation function is related to, sorry, I put D to R there, is related to the same correlation function with an insertion of the current that generates the, the symmetry. Uh, it does. It it just makes sure that you uh, that, that that you're looking at the connected part here. Yes, it will come in. Okay, so I'm now going to actually take this this change here and massage it a little bit. I can integrate by parts, okay? So I can write this as minus the, the integral d mu, t mu nu, alpha nu, d2r 
plus a boundary term. So let's talk about the this term before we discuss the the, the boundary term. So so we're integrating over 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 this region. I've just integrated by parts. I've got a minus sign. I've got the derivative on here. So this term here has to be zero. And it's zero because I told you that T mu nu was conserved, but it has to be zero anyway, because I told you that this interpolating function here is pretty arbitrary. Okay, any smooth function, any differentiable function, which, which took us from here to here would have, would have done. So the answer in my conformal word identity here cannot possibly depend upon the details of this function alpha in this region. Okay, can't depend on that. So actually the only way this, this can happen is if the stress tensor is conserved. So that's an independent argument as well, it has to be. And then there are boundary terms. So, so I, I'm integrating both parts I'm, and there are going to be boundary terms uh, which are going to be uh, an integral of, over the outer boundary alpha nu t mu nu ds nu where ds mu is the normal I should call it dn mu is, is the normal is a, is a component of length, but it's a vector normal to the boundary here, dn mu. So there is one term from here, and there's a term which probably has a minus sign, integral dc alpha mu t mu nu dn mu, which is from the inner boundary here. Okay. So... This term is zero because alpha is zero outside and we go smoothly between here and here. So alpha is zero on the outer boundary. So the only term that is left is this term here. So the change in the action is actually equal to the integral around the inner boundary here of, uh, of, of C alpha mu, d mu nu, d n mu. And I may have the sign wrong, but that's the, that's the main thing. Okay, so, so, and you can see actually, because this thing is conserved, because t mu nu is conserved, it didn't actually matter where I drew c. As long as it goes around phi, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Now I want to write this in complex coordinates, and I'm not going to go through the algebra because I think it would just take too long and it's just algebra. So, so the point is that that's this surface, that this surface integral around C can in fact be written as a contour integral, one over two pi i, integral, a contour integral around C, thinking of this as a complex contour, alpha of C, T of C, DC, minus 1 over 2 pi, integral alpha of C bar, alpha, the whole thing complex conjugates, T bar, D bar, DC bar. So here, C bar does mean the complex conjugate, but T bar does not. So this is just algebra, just to go from here to here. Okay, so what, what have I just shown? I have shown that, that, the, that the change in a correlation function with a field inside C can be written as a contour integral of a correlation function of T. Now we're going to use this here to, to actually see what, what Hess means. But the, 
before I go on? Any questions? It doesn't what? No, it's an infinitesimal one. Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, no, uh, there are th interesting things that we can talk about inversion, but um, no, I'm only looking at, we're just looking at the algebra of the, at the, at the of infinitesimal conformal transformations. But I told you that you can get an infinitesimal conformal transformation by doing an inversion, an infinitesimal translation, and an inversion back again. So that's one example of alpha. All right, so let's see. I think I need to erase some what we what we so then we've got the integral one over two pi the integral of z t z times phi of zero t z okay is going to be, okay, so that's what we have from the word identity, is going to be just a change in phi of zero under a constant shift, but that's just going to be alpha d by dc of phi of zero, because all we do is change the argument here, so instead of evaluating phi at zero, we, z goes to z plus alpha, so in particular zero goes to alpha, so the first order change is just going to be alpha d by dc of phi, okay? Now if we insert the OPE here, which is way over there somewhere, and I put z1 equal to zero, my cj equal to zero. What we see is that there's a term in the alpha. There is a term in the, in the OPE here, which is one over z d by dc one l minus one of phi of zero. And then there's a term that looks like z to the zero, and there's a term that looks like one over z squared, and there's a term blah, blah, blah. But by Cauchy's theorem, if you do this contour, contour, contour integral here about this point, what you're going to do is to pick up the residue of the pole, which is this term here. Okay? So if we, if you do this, this, contour integral, you are going to get alpha times L minus 1. So we see that L minus 1 phi is nothing but the derivative of phi. Okay. So in this particular expansion here, there's a particularly simple term here, which is L minus 1 phi j. It turns out this term is is straightforward as well. So instead of taking alpha z to be a constant, I'm going to take alpha z equal to lambda times times z. So z goes into z into one plus lambda. This is a scale transformation or a possible rotation if lambda is, is, is a constant. So I've got lambda z here. And now, what is the change in the field under a scale transformation? So it goes like uh, one. So the, the Jacobian of this transformation is just, or the derivative is just one plus lambda. So I get one plus lambda to, so phi zero plus delta phi zero is, one plus lambda to the delta, the Jacobian to the power delta times phi of zero. So delta phi of zero 
expanding it to first order is, is lambda times delta times phi is zero. Okay, so I once again make the OPE because there's now a Z here, I'm going to take up the term here, which is one over Z squared L zero. And so what I see is that L zero phi is equal to delta times phi. So this term we also know is just delta J times times phi. Okay, so any questions there? So that's important. So these are these are two terms that we know in the OP of T with with, with delta phi. Now let's suppose that 1 over z minus cj squared times delta j times phi j is the most singular term. In the OPE, t with phi j. Let's suppose it is. So this Laurent series stops here. And there's a whole bunch of other terms here. But this is telling us that we know all the singular terms. We know this term, we know this term, and all the rest is analytic. Okay? So that means that we actually know the correlation function of T with everything, if that's the case. So, even, so, if we're looking at the correlation function of t with 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 phi one of z one, phi two of z two, dot dot dot, this correlation function, and all these scaling fields have this property that there's no more singular terms here. If they do, then as a function of z. We know this is an analytic function, and we know all its singularities because we know that this term and this term and so on. This is just the derivative. So that means that we know the function. Okay, it's a it's, it's a theorem in analytic function theory that if you have a function analytic and you know all its singularities then you know the function. Therefore we actually know if we know this correlation function we know all the correlation functions with the stress tensor. So that's a, that's a very important step in the analysis. Now why was I justified in making this assumption? Well let's 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 just say that if 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 this is true if this is true then by definition we we say that phi j is primary it's a primary field okay so uh, well that's fine but that's just a, a definition but what you can actually show is that all the fields in the theory can be either primary or what we call descendants of them. So so in order to, to in order to understand that I have to draw another picture. So we start off with phi, which is primary. Right? And it has scaling dimension delta. Then what I can do, as you 
approach this to then this has the property that all the things to the left are zero. So, so, so it has the property that L n of phi with n greater than or equal to 1 is zero. Take K, because by my, by my definition here, L, L1 would be, L1 would be 1 over C cubed, L2 would be 1 over, over K to the fourth. So, so the fact that it truncates here, that's a definition of a primary. Okay? But then there are descendants of this, which, which, which I can get by taking the OPE with T. So this has dimension delta plus one, this has dimension delta plus two, delta plus three, etc. These are all fine. So I get these by, so these are defined by my equation here, by taking an OPE of, of this primary field with T. But I can do it again. Each of these, I can then take an OPE of these with, 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 with T. So I can get L minus one times L minus one phi, or L minus one squared phi. And here I can get L minus one, L minus two phi, comma, and I can get L minus one cubed phi. Okay, so, so, I, so I get, these are all called descendants. It's a matter of controversy whether you spell this with an A or an E. I think, I think Google says an A, but anyway. Descendants or descendants. Anyway, so, so, so here's the sort of ancestor. These are all the, the descendants. So, so it's then a theorem, which I'm not going to prove, that every field in the theory is either primary or is a descendant of a primary. Okay. So that's why I can restrict myself to primaries most of the time. First of all, because they're the ones with the smallest scaling dimension, so they're the most interesting ones. They're the ones whose correlators fall off the least fast. But once I know the correlation functions of the primaries, just by taking OPEs with T, which I said I knew all of these, then I can work out the correlation functions of all the of all the descendants. Okay. Any questions there? Are you exhausted yet? Yeah, right here. So, 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 for example, the one over z minus zj cubed. This will be l plus one phi, and this is zero. L two, L three, and so forth. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask the question, what about the stress tensor itself? Is the stress tensor primary? Well, we could have a vote on it, but uh, I think I'll just tell you the answer that we need to And the answer is no. Because the way I check that is I take the OPE of T with itself. Okay. And this is going to have various terms. I know it's going to have a 1 over Z squared, T of 0. And the number up here is going to be the dimension of T, which I already told you was 2. 
And then there's a term here, which is one over z times the derivative of t, then all these regular terms. But then there has to be, a, 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 um, I will, in principle, there could be a, a one over z cubed term, but I'll just in a moment argue that that can't be there. And then there is a term which goes like one over z to the fourth. And this has to be there because if I take the two-point function of t in this equation, so I take just take the expectation value of both sides of 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 s s equation, then I get the expectation value of all these terms, which has to be zero. And the reason that the expectation value of t has to be zero is uh, that it transforms non-trivially under rotations. So actually rotational, you can't have in the plane, you can't have a, an expectation value for t because that would break rotational invariance. So, so these terms all, all go away. But this number here, because t is, has dimension two, this is going to be a pure number. That is proportional to one, right? So its expectation value can be non, non, non zero. And normally when we have a two point function, we normalize the fields such that the two-point function has coefficient of one over this. But we can't do this here for the stress tensor because we've already defined the normalization of the stress tensor independently as the response of the action to a strain. So this number here has to, has to be a pure number and, it, and we call it C over two so that the expectation value two-point function goes like c over two, c to the fourth. This thing has to be zero just because of permutation symmetry. This has to be an even function of t, so that can't be there. Okay, so the OPE of t with itself um, is, so this thing is really L2 of t, and it's non-zero. So, so, so T itself is not primary, but this introduces this number here. Okay, but apart from that, we do know the form of, of the OP of, of T with itself, and this is now going to lead to the next thing, which is the Thurisoro algebra. So I'm going to ask what happens if I take a, if I take for example a primary field, it doesn't matter whether it's primary or not, do ln with it, that is take the OP of t and pick out the appropriate term there. And then do another OP with, with t so I get lm ln of phi. Is this equal to question mark? ln lm phi? And the answer is, once again, no. But the commutator is going to be interesting. Okay, so how do I get this? So, if I use my definition over here of what I mean by ln phi, use Cauchy's theorem to say that ln phi is equal, is equal to, let's suppose it's at the origin, is equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral around the contour around the origin of z to the n plus 1 t of z times phi 
zero bz. Okay, because if I do this contour integral multiplied by z to the n plus one in this, 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 this thing here, multiply this by z minus zj, where now zj is zero, two n plus one, that's gonna pick up the residue of this expansion. So, so, so I can represent this in picture. So here's my contour C. I've got, uh, I've got phi of zero here, I've got T of C sitting somewhere on this contour, and I'm supposed to do the contour integral here. On the other hand, if I want to work out LM, LN phi, times zero, then I have to do the same thing again with a different contour. C prime, Z prime to the M plus one, T of Z prime, integral around C of Z to the M plus one, T of Z, phi of zero, and there's a DZ prime, and there's, there's a DZ. So, 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 this is T of Z, Z to the M plus one, and then I have to surround it by a larger contour, which is C prime, and on this contour, I have T of Z prime, Z prime to the M, M, M plus one. Okay, so I've got this double contour. On the other hand, if I want to look at LN, LM, what I, what I, and I want to work out the commutator, what I want to do is to subtract off something that looks like the same picture, except that I've, I've exchanged the two contours. So now here is C prime, here is C, here is T of Z, Z to the M plus one, here is T of Z prime, Z prime to the M plus one, here's my so, so the question is, what, how can I work out that? Well, I can do it by distorting contours. So what I can do with this contour here, I can, so, 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 so basically, Here's the thing I'm integrating. So I can I can take this contour inside it. So here's C prime. I can I can I can I can take C inside it as long as I leave a little bit outside here, because this becomes singular when I take it past here because of the OP of T with the T. So I can't move this contour entirely past here. I must leave a little bit outside there. And then I can rub out this neck here. Okay, and then I've got C here. So the... So... This can be written as the sum of an integral around C inside C prime, which is this, plus an extra piece. So therefore the, the, the difference can be represented by a contour integral around C prime of a contour integral. Okay. So you can imagine that 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 I that I can do this contour integral integral because there's a t here and there's a t here and I can use the OPE of 
T with T, which I know, to work out the contribution of this contour integral. It's going to involve T itself. So I'm going to end up as, a, as something involving a contour. So the LP of T with T involves T. So I'm going to end up with a contour integral of something times T around C, which can then be related back to the LNs. Okay, so once again, this is algebra. In this case, it takes about two pages of, of algebra, and I'm certainly not going to have this on the board. But, but the result of this algebra is that Lm is that the commutator acting on the field phi, but there is nothing in here that says anything about phi. So it's a statement about the pure commutator is equal to m minus n, l m plus n. Okay, so that, these terms, these terms come from this term here and this, 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 Um, uh, but there's, there is an additional term which, which comes from the term involving C, and this has the form C over 12 M, sorry, M, M squared minus 1 times a delta function that says M equal to minus N. So this is called the Kurosawa algebra. And it's the algebra of infinitesimal conformal transformations. Okay, so we have a, so in understanding what this means, let's just go back to rotations. Okay, rotations in three dimensions. We have group is SO3, or if you like, it's isomorphic to SU2, as you know. And we have a three parameter group of rotations, parameterized, for example, by the Euler angles. We have the generators of these rotations, J1, J2, J3, which are the angular momentum. They obey an algebra of commutators, which is the Lie algebra of SU2. So this is the Lie algebra of the of the algebra of conformal mappings in in, in no dimensions. So so there's a couple of, of differences. One is that we have an infinite number of generators instead of three, which we had here. The other thing is this term here, which is in the mathematics literature, is called a central term. That's, that is, it's a term which we can just think of as a pure number. But it commutes with all the generators of the algebra. And in SU2, we do not have that. But here we do. And of course, it's important because the central charge last time is an important measurable quantity. Any questions? Because now we're going to be looking into uh, a couple of properties of this Kurosawa algebra. I'm, I'm not going to quite finish, but that's okay. Um, let's uh, go on and see what, what this means. I hope everybody understands the way this argument proceeds without me going through the horrible algebra analysis. I haven't found a neat way of doing it at all. All right, so let's look at the Virasoro algebra then. If we look at Lm 
L0, this is equal to M L, L M. Okay, so we have a special case where we put N equal to zero, this term is not there. So that means that, that if you take a field Y which, which has, has scaling dimensions delta, then, and we take LM act, act, acting on this, and we then take L0 acting on that, what we get is, is, um, is minus the commutator into the multiplier plus LM L0 pi. But this is just delta scaling dimension times pi. So, so, so as it, this is a number, so this is just delta LM phi. And this thing is M LM phi. So, so what we see is that L0 acting on LM phi is equal to delta minus M Okay, so that tells us that the scaling dimension of Lm phi is just delta minus m. That's just what we had here, right? In this picture, which unfortunately I haven't erased. So this has scaling dimension delta. This corresponds to m minus 1. So it has scaling dimension delta plus 1, delta plus 2, etc. So we can think of the LMs as raising and lowering operators. LM with M positive, okay, are, are like, um, well, they lower the value of delta, but they, we're going to think of, okay, we usually call these raising operators because we, we, we actually think of them as, as moving us upwards here. So the LMs with LM positive move, move us upwards. The LMs with M, with M positive do this, with M negative do, do, do that. So we actually call, call these things raising up. LMs with M negative, we think of as lowering operators. But that's just, just, just terminology. And I want to argue now by, by analogy with the case SU2, which I just I erased. So, if we think about SU2, then we have JZ, and we always think about eigenstates of JZ with, 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 with eigenvalue M, okay? Because this commutes with J squared. So we can look, simultaneously we have something called the Casimir with J squared. JC and these 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 things commute. So we can we look at states with which are eigenstates of the total angular momentum and the Z component. And then we have raising and and lowering operators which are JX plus or minus IJY. And, and these act to lower and raise things. For example, JZ acting on J plus or minus M is equal to M plus or minus 1J plus or minus M. So we use these raising and lowering operators in SU2 to, to construct representations of the algebra. They, and how does that work? So 
So we, we take the state with the maximum value of J0. This is called the highest weight state. Wait, it's annihilated by J plus. Okay, so in the representation, that's the state with the largest value of JZ. We then keep acting on 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 this 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 state with the lowering operators. So this highest weight state has eigenvalues which is jz max, which is jz max minus one, et cetera, et cetera. j minus squared, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so we build up the representation that way. This is called the highest weight representation. But what we find when we analyze this is that this procedure has to stop. And it has to stop because if we don't stop, then we get into states that have negative norm. We, that, that, that what you find is that you eventually have to get to, 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 to a state where j minus to the k, jz max equals zero. And then you can't go down anymore because everything else is, is, is zero. But if you don't do that, then at the next stage, you will get to a state whose square is negative. Okay. And that's how you see the quantization of angular momentum. Because this, this, this then puts a constraint on the allowed values of JZ max, and it says that it has to be an integer or a half integer, and so on. Okay, so um, the reason that I've belabored that is that we can get into the same analysis of the representations of the Gurusoro algebra. So, what I've drawn here is, in fact, a highest weight representation. Erisoro algebra. This is precisely the same as what we're doing here. The only difference is that instead of just having one lowering operator, J minus, we have an infinite number. We have L minus one, which can act as many times as, as we want. We have L minus two, L minus three, and all possible products. So the representations are going to be more complicated, but the, well, what's going to happen, and I'm not going to do this now, is that in order for us to get a unitary representation, which corresponds to having a conformal field theory where the two-point functions are positive, we, we again have to have states which are, which are essentially Zero. Okay. Once you once you once you have this this state here, you can either say that its norm is zero, or you can say that j plus on this is also zero. So it itself is a highest weight state. Okay. So what's actually going to happen here is that within this representation, we are going to find certain linear combinations here, which themselves are going to be highest weight, that is annihilated by all the raising operators. And what we're going to do next time is to just look at the simplest case where we look at level two here, and, and we ask, we can take any linear combination of, of, of these, and we ask what happens if a linear combination happens to correspond to a highest weight, corresponds to a primary operator. Okay, 
So um, we will then stop at this point and we will uh, go on next time. I didn't quite do as much as I wanted today, but it was always going to be a bit of a mammoth marathon. So I hope you're not completely exhausted. And if you have any questions, please ask them now or later. Yeah. Well, okay, so uh, in the contour integral, remember that, that what, what we were doing was there was a T here and a T here, and that that's the smallest larger. There's a T here and a T here, and the C term goes like 1 over Z minus Z prime over 4. And then we've got all these things involving z prime to the n plus 1, z to the n, okay? So, so what we have to do in order to, uh, is, is that we need the residue of this at z equals z prime. So we have to expand, for example, this term about z prime and get the term of order 1 over z minus z prime. And you can see when you do that, that's going to be something that's just cubic in n of, of order n, n cubed. And that's why it's You can see why it's cubic. But, uh, does that answer your question? Okay, I, I don't think that was quite what I was trying to say. Okay, um, C is going to be a particular property of the particular conformal field theory. We don't know what it is yet. We would like to be able to classify all possible values of, of C, and we'll see next time if there are other such circumstances we can. Right? Uh, but you can't write, I mean, if you, if you were to tell me the two-point function of t, then I could write c as a contour integral, but I'm not sure that that would really help, right? So I can write c as being proportional to the c cubed c z c zero p z, right? One over t by i, but I'm not sure that that. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or not. Any more questions? Okay, well. Uh, okay, so so I said that T of Z is all the correlation functions are analytic and they don't have branch rules. So when T approaches, well, when T of Z approaches T of zero, then it has to have this Laurent expansion, right? So it has to have integer powers there. So that's what I was, I guess I've erased it, but, uh, uh, but that's what, what I was saying, but there has to be a term of order one over z to the fourth, otherwise the two-point function is going to be zero. And it had better not be zero because if the two-point function is zero, then t is zero. Yeah. Um, yeah, right now we've just introduced it. Um, okay, I told you, uh, well, I told you at our proof that when you, when you measure the ground state energy on the cylinder that exists at C, I probably won't be able to get to quite to the argument of why they're 
related, but it is a measure of quality. It's very important. I mean, it comes in all over the place, basically. Um, no. I mean, if you gave me an extra week, I could explain it. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. I have to be selective. 